Hi everyone, and welcome back. Thank you very much for your positive feedback on my last video, where I compared the CPU benchmarks of the NEC TurboGrafx-16, Sega Genesis, and Super Nintendo. In this video, I'll perform a similar benchmark comparison, focusing on the Video Display Processors, or VDP. I hope you'll enjoy this one too. As an introduction, Here's a high-level representation showing the typical architecture used in the 16-bit consoles. The CPU reads information from the game cartridge and copies the required graphical data to the Video Random Access Memory, or VRAM. The VDP is able to read the VRAM and then display the resulting graphics on screen. Table 1 shows a comparison of the specifications of each console. While the TurboGrafx-16 has an 8-bit CPU, it has two 16-bit video processors. The Hudson HU6270 is the main video processor, and the HU6260 is the color encoder. One of the TurboGrafx-16's greatest strengths is the ability to display up to 482 colors on screen. However, its primary limitation was having only one background layer. This made it difficult, although not impossible, to produce parallax and multi-layered background effects. The Sega Genesis has a custom Sega 315-5313 chip, which runs at a high clock speed compared to its peers. The Genesis also typically had a higher screen resolution, although all three consoles had the capability of displaying higher resolutions. I'm sure you'll agree that one of the greatest weaknesses of the Genesis is the number of on-screen colors. It's rumored that the decision to limit on-screen colors to only 64 was to keep backwards compatibility with the Sega Master System. The Super Nintendo has two video processors. PPU1 is the main video processor, and PPU2 provides additional graphical effects. The Super Nintendo has an impressive 15-bit color palette. It could also display up to four background layers, including the famous Mode 7, which enables the scaling and rotation of one background layer. The Super Nintendo also had the largest number of sprites on screen. However, it also has the slowest clock speed of the three systems, and we'll see if that factors into the graphical performance. For reference, I've highlighted the best parameters. It seems that the Genesis and Super Nintendo are fairly even. The TurboGrafx-16 isn't too far behind, and we'll see how they perform in a real test. The graphics for each 16-bit console consisted of background layers and sprites. I'm sure many of you will recognize Altered Beast, one of the first games on the Sega Genesis. This game has two background layers, and I'll turn the first one off. You'll notice the background has changed and I'll also turn off the second layer. All we have now are the sprites, which consist of game characters, enemies, and status. Putting the three side by side, it's obvious that the backgrounds cover a much larger area of the screen than the sprites. That's not to say that drawing sprites is trivial, as each sprite can move independently. For our performance test in this video, we will only consider the background layer, and not the sprites. Background graphics are drawn as a rectangular grid of tiles. Tiles are square blocks, typically 8 by 8 pixels, although the Super Nintendo and Turbo Graphics also supported 16 by 16 tiles. As shown in the example below, this subdivides the screen into many smaller blocks. For a typical Super Nintendo game having a screen resolution of 256 by 224 pixels, there would be 32 horizontal and 28 vertical 8x8 tiles. This would amount to having 896 total tiles on screen. Here's an example using AirZonk on the TurboGrafx-16. Let's assume that this image is purely drawn on the background layer. When we split the background into grids, you can see each tile representing a small area of the screen. The video processor is able to quickly draw these tiles and produce very impressive graphics using minimal processing and memory requirements. We will now design a synthetic benchmark to test the performance of each console's video display processor. A synthetic benchmark uses an intensive algorithm that is designed to push a system to its limit. To be fair to all consoles, 
will use an 8x8 pixel tile grid with a resolution of 256 by 224 pixels. Once we are ready, we'll run a comparison test using multiple emulators. This will provide greater confidence that the results are close to testing on real hardware. Our proposed algorithm is to display 32 by 28 pixel background tiles for 4,608 times. This is equivalent to drawing over 4 million background tiles. As shown, we'll first turn the screen on. Then, we'll use a quadruple nested for loop that will draw a single tile during each iteration. Once complete, the screen will turn off. By calculating the time between the first tiles are drawn and the screen is turned off, we can determine the speed of operation. Here's a summary of each console's assembly code. You'll notice the TurboGrafx and Super Nintendo syntax is very similar. Because the TurboGrafx-16 has an 8-bit CPU, it requires two write operations to transfer 16 bits of data. This may introduce a performance limitation for the TurboGrafx, and we'll soon find out. The Sega Genesis has eight data registers, which help keep the code compact and closer in syntax to modern high-level programming languages. We're ready to start the test, and we'll begin in a few seconds. Wow, I think the results this time are even more surprising than the previous benchmark test. I was sure the Genesis would win this round, and I didn't expect the Super Nintendo was this fast. I repeated the test using multiple emulators, and the results are summarized in Table 2. This helps give us more certainty that the results are likely similar to running on real hardware. The results show that the Super Nintendo has very efficient video display processors. Even though the Super Nintendo has the slowest CPU and VDP clock speeds, it appears to require very few clock cycles per instruction. The TurboGrafx-16 wasn't far behind, which is especially surprising as it requires two write operations to transfer 16 bits of graphical data with its 8-bit main CPU. I think the Genesis struggled with the quadruple nested for loop, and there's likely a more efficient way to optimize its performance, as well as the performance of the other consoles. It's important to remember that we are using a synthetic benchmark algorithm for this test, which would probably never be used in a real game. All three consoles performed very well overall. As shown in Table 3, they are able to draw an entire screen of background tiles at a high rate. This would give the video processor and the main CPU plenty of time for other tasks, like drawing sprites, running game logic, and so on. It's remarkable to think that these consoles were designed over 32 years ago. The fact that we're discussing them today shows their continuing legacy and impact on many generations of gamers. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and let me know if you'd like to see more of these in the future. See you next time.